Hello everybody and welcome back to our lecture series. I'm Ted, your host, and for this lecture we're going to continue right where we last left off. In our last lecture we were looking at the end of the, the second massive confrontation between the, uh, the Carthaginians and the Romans uh, during the Second Punic War. We had just seen Lucius Cornelius, uh, no, why do, why do I keep saying Lucius? It's Publius, Publius Cornelius Scipio uh, emerged supreme over Hannibal Barca uh, at the Battle of Zama. And the Battle of Zama forced the Carthaginians to acknowledge defeat. It forced them to uh, come to terms with the Romans. And the Second Punic War would have a number of effects. Uh, but it would have five principal or five important effects on the Romans and the Carthaginians. First of which was that Carthage was once again find a large cash indemnity by the Romans. Second, uh, Carthage um, or, or Carthaginian North Africa, now just called Africa by the Romans, and the Iberian Peninsula, um, now called Hispania, um, by the Romans were all seized and converted into tax paying provinces under Roman governors. Third, the city of Carthage had to give up all of its territory and reduce her military. Fourth, the Roman army became more professional and more proficient uh, because over the course of the Second Punic War, the, the Roman army, which before had really been little more than an ad hoc citizen levy of men from Rome and around Italy, uh, became more professional. Um, it, it became a it became a professional standing army of of uh, of career military men. And again, this is a marked contrast to what existed before. Before the Roman army was little more than an ad hoc citizen levy uh, from around Italy under the command of semi professional uh, patricians, uh, Roman noble elites. Um, Scipio. Scipio, during the course of, of the new war, he introduced a new sword and new tactics. And from now on, the Romans would have a qualitative edge over their future enemies. They would approach war in a much more organized manner. And fifth, uh, the, the fifth great effect was that Scipio received a lot of dignitas in Rome. Scipio was the savior of the city of Rome and he was the savior of of Italy. He was the savior of every city in the Roman Confederation. Scipio had defeated Hannibal in battle, something that most people thought just could not be done. Scipio had conquered Africa, uh, and, and, and at this point Africa is simply what the Romans called the, the home region of, of the Carthaginians. He would thereafter be known as Scipio Africanus, and Africanus literally translates to uh, conqueror of Africa. So he's Scipio, the conqueror of Africa. And the public influence and prestige afforded to Scipio undermined the careful balance of rough equality between the patricians. This is the first kink, the, the first kink in the armor of the Roman Republic. We now see one man soar head and shoulders above his, his contemporaries. Uh, they really, they really aren't equal to uh, Scipio. Scipio is on a whole nother plane. And Scipio and his family, they began to dominate the affairs of the Republic. Now, with the conclusion of the Second Punic War, the Romans are the undisputed masters of the Western Mediterranean. And so now, with the Western Mediterranean under their control, they turn and they begin to look eastward. They begin to look towards the Eastern Mediterranean. And there were various Hellenistic kingdoms, uh, the, the successor to the old um, Argead or Macedonian Empire in the east that, that were just uh, sort of laying in wait to be pit, uh, plucked by, by this new Roman force. Now, the Eastern Mediterranean was more cultured, it was urbanized, it was wealthier, and it was home to the, to the, to the cultural traditions that we have been tracking throughout this course. The Eastern Mediterranean was also greatly unknown to the Romans. Um, a, a telling example of this was that after a victory in Asia Minor, um, the, the Roman Senate had to be given an impromptu geography lesson to explain where the battle was. Uh, had, they had to be given a social studies lesson to be, uh, to, um, to be told whom they were fighting against. And they also had to be given um, uh, and, and, uh, another sort of crux or, or, or reason 
for the uh, for the for the geography lesson, but that they had to be uh, it had to be explained to the Roman Republic exactly what bit of territory was now under Roman control. Now the Romans eventually wore down all resistance in the Eastern Mediterranean, and one by one they conquered all of the territories in the east. Um, uh, uh, one by one until reorganizing these, ter uh, these territories into coherent Roman-style tax-paying provinces under a, a yearly governor. Now, Scipio's family, uh, Scipio's family continued to dominate military affairs as well. Uh, all, all the way throughout the Roman conquest, Scipio's family, um, particularly his brother, were, were given key commands in the east. And this allowed them to earn the title, uh, to, to continue earning titles, to, to uh, continue earning these uh, the conqueror titles. For example, Scipio uh, Africanus' brother uh, became known as Scipio Asiaticus, uh, Scipio the Conqueror of Asia. So their family is earning, uh, is attaining just a great amount of military prestige. Uh, the Roman conquest of Greece, Macedon, and Asia Minor also had two great effects on the Romans. First, the Romans were exposed to the rich culture and civic sophistication of the East. Um, when they when they returned to Italy, they brought that culture back with them. Now, the Romans returned home with artworks, literature, and Eastern slaves, and mainly these, these Eastern slaves were Greeks. And the, the educated slaves would go on to become the tutors for the Roman patrician families. Uh, and, and this had the uh, the the, um, the the effect of raising the cultural sophistication of the future generation of Roman leaders. Now, during the course of conquering the Eastern Mediterranean, Rome made war on the weak and hapless Carthaginians. Uh, and at this point, the Carthaginians, um, uh, the Carthaginians are, are are shell. They are in many ways a shell of their former selves. Um, but but Rome is in no uh, in, in no way uh, ready to, um, to, to to tolerate the existence of Carthage, they, they set out to finally break their former great adversary. They send out another Scipio, who dutifully sacks Carthage, he burns the city, he sells off the remaining Carthaginians into slavery, and the younger Scipio uh, had been raised in the New Rome, and he had been exposed to the teachings of the East. And according to legend, uh, had he walked the destructions of Carthage, this once mighty and proud city, he lamented that one day a similar fate would befall Rome. Now, uh, the the second conquest of the Eastern Med uh now, now, now the second thing to draw away from from Rome's activities in the East is that the conquest enriches Rome. And I don't mean culturally, I don't mean militarily, I mean financially. Um, the conquest of the Eastern Mediterranean makes Rome the focal point of the Mediterranean world. Trade routes allow linking Rome with all these different places. The Romans are taxing all of these trade routes. And for the first time, we have one super hegemonic power controlling the entire Mediterranean world. Uh, the, Medi the Mediterranean world becomes a great um, fiscal nerve center and the Romans are reaping all these benefits. Uh, the Romans are now the wealthiest people in the Mediterranean. The Roman treasury is simply bursting it so full. And successful generals, generals who go out and who conquer uh, vast areas, they're enriched. They're enriched by the foils of war. Their soldiers are enriched. They come back with gold, silver, artwork, jewelry, slaves. They, they come back wealthy. The Eastern Mediterranean makes the war uh, make the Romans so wealthy that they can now go out and, and they really abolish a lot of their forms of citizen taxation. Um, on the surface, Roman imperialism and expansion looks like a success. Um, Rome has gained power, wealth, prestige, and culture. Now, lurking within uh, the background are our forces. Are forces that will result in the collapse of the Roman Republic. The external conquests that that uh, that sort of propelled the city of Rome, um, they 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 uh, exacerbate existing internal tensions. Roman imperialism creates a very vicious cycle that ultimately makes every segment of Roman society resentful and unhappy. With the professionalization of the Roman military. Many Roman and Italic allies, they, 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 uh, they, they simply come and they join the army 
um, and to do so, uh, and, and to do so to afford the uh, the military equipment, they're forced to sell their land. Uh, they they sell their lands, uh, they sell their farms, they go overseas, and, and they're overseas for years at a time. Uh, and a few get rich due to their military careers, but the majority do not. Uh, and when they return to Italy, they are homeless, they are penniless, and they have nowhere to go but to head to the city of Rome. During during this period, the population of the city of Rome uh, of Rome expands. It explodes, and it, it's uh, it's somewhere around one million residents by the year 100 BCE. Now, the result of the expansion um, uh, results in the in the loss of the small family farm. Um, while successful generals who are coming back with great amounts of wealth, um, the, the 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 average soldier is not. Um, the the there was not a lot that one could do with wealth in the ancient world um, other than simply invest in land and invest in slaves. So a perfect storm was created whereby just as the small farmer was selling off their land and moving to the cities, the generals were coming back with thousands of, uh, of slaves and, 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 uh, and, and lots of money. The Italian countryside was transformed from a, a large number of uh, from being home to simply uh, an innumerable amount of small family farms to be in home to a small number of gigantic plantation like estates worked by uh, gangs of slaves. Now Roman imperialism created the vicious cycle that feeds on itself. Uh, foreign wars produce more poor veterans. Uh, the foreign wars also produce more wealthy generals. Um, and and uh, the generals are buying off these, uh, these farms that are being sold off by the poor Romans, uh, by the poor Roman and Italic peoples, and and instead of finding employment on these farms, uh, the generals are simply bringing in their foreign slaves to work these farms. So it's a very vicious cycle in effect. Now, in the end, all of the groups involved would be unhappy with the arrangement. The Roman veterans are resentful because they feel betrayed by the state uh, after they had done their duty. Um, they they still end up poor, uh, landless, and and really ignored. The patricians are unhappy because all of the wealth and dignity from the wars are being monopolized by a few prominent families. Uh, the Italic allies are unhappy because they are still not full citizens. They are fighting in the Roman armies. They are sharing the collective destiny with Rome, but they are not uh, Roman citizens. They do not have the full rights. Uh, they do not have full citizens' rights. Uh, in addition, uh, they they don't they don't, they're not even considered for a share of all that overseas wealth, and they want a share of that overseas wealth. They, they want a share in all of the greatness befalling Rome. And, and uh, of course, finally, we, we come to the slaves. And of course, the slaves brought into Italy are understandably and reasonably disgruntled. Uh, one, they're being made slaves, and then two, they're being transported to Italy and touted off as, uh, as tokens of conquest and being forced into very arduous manual labor. Uh, and the slaves, the slaves are deeply angry, they are deeply unhappy. For all of their efforts, Roman imperialism produced a huge cauldron of resentment that was just bubbling over. And also the political system was now gasping under the strain of, of administering this new empire. Now the tensions and resentments that, that have been developing, they reach a critical mass between the years 133 uh, and 31 BCE and the resulting crisis uh, leads to the dissolution of the Roman Republic. Uh, the death of the Republic begins with the grandsons of Scipio Africanus, a pair known as the Gracchi. Now the elder brother was a man named Tiberius Gracchus uh, and he became worried about the tensions building. He decided to do something about it. He ran for and he was elected to the office of Tribune of the Plebs and being inspired by the fate, uh, by, by the sight of, of dispossessed farmers um, m uh, walking away uh, and, uh, and also being inspired by the, by, the, by the fact that these great aristocratic estates were being worked by slaves, Tiberius Gracchus uh, took advantage of the Tribune's power to propose laws and he put forth a new piece of legislation directly before the people uh, without first consulting with the Senate and that was a major faux pas in Roman um, in Roman history. Now the Senate did not have the power to pass laws on its own, but the, the Senate did take it upon themselves to 
to simply be the first body uh, that that any sort of legislation sort of filters through. Uh, through. Um, they, 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 they took it upon themselves after the expulsion of the kings to move from being a simply ad hoc advisory council to being a a sort of a behind the scenes um, governing board. Uh, and what we see now, what we see now that the now now with uh, with Gracchus, Gracchus simply sidestepped them because he he probably already knew that the Senate wasn't going to act on any of its legislation. But he sets himself at odds openly with the Senate by not bringing it to them by blindsiding them with this. Now the main thrust of of uh, Tiberius Gracchus's proposal was a new law that would limit the amount of land one man was allowed to own. He also included a provision to distribute government land amongst the poor Roman citizens. And after hearing of his plans, a number of senators and their followers, they became enraged. Uh, they broke up the benches uh, that they were sitting on and they beat Tiberius to Gra uh, Tiberius Gracchus to death along with 300 of his followers. And this is a very shocking event. This is blood in the Senate house. Uh, this is blood on the Senate floor. This is a breakdown in Roman order. This violence, the fact that the Senate um, descended into chaos, descended into madness, and they murdered uh, Tiberius and his, uh, his followers, it, 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 it sets a tone that will be followed by everybody else. The death of Tiberius Gracchus was a shocking event and a harbinger of things to come. In the late Roman Republic, politicians will begin to use open violence to settle their political disagreements. Political violence will become the norm uh, from, from this point on until the collapse of the uh, Roman Empire in the West. Now, 10 years later, in 123 BCE, the younger brother of, of, uh, of Tiberius Gracchus, Gaius Gracchus, uh, he decides to run uh, for office and he decided to pick up where his elder brother had left off. Now Gaius runs for and he is also elected tribune and after his election he promptly puts forward the very same legislation that his brother had suggested. Now Gaius was very aware that there were other dissatisfied groups in Rome. He added a number of redresses uh, designed to, uh, to build a broad consensus of support for his proposal. He proposed that the Roman government give subsidized grain to all the inhabitants of Rome. Uh, and, and this was a, a relief measure for the city destitute. Uh, he also proposed that the Italic allies finally be granted full Roman citizenship. Uh, and, this, and this goes a long way to regressing their grievances over not being able to enjoy the fruits of the empire that they were paying for with their military service and of course with their blood in their lives. Now, Gaius Gracchus, he also proposes building more roads within Italy had the means of improving communication, travel, and commerce in addition to providing just basically more work for the unemployed. Now the Senate once again is unenthused by the proposals and they start smarting over the negative reaction um, uh, over the negative reaction of being informed of this. But they cannot do anything publicly to, uh, to attack uh, Gaius, because the people, uh, the, the people of the city of Rome, they're still smarting over the, uh, over the uh, the fact that Tiberius Gracchus was murdered by a group of senators and their uh, and their uh, clients. The senators they do not kill Gaius Gracchus. They simply let it be known that they will reward the man who does so. And it is not long before an assassin kills Gaius. Uh, Gaius Gracchus is killed, and its head is presented um, to the to the uh, to the senators. And the, and the senators who put the bounty on Gaius's head, quite literally, they they uh, they pay the assassin uh, seventeen pounds of gold for for uh, for his deed. And, it's, and the assassin gets seventeen pounds of gold because he he poured lead into the uh, into the skull, into the head, the cranial cavity of Gaius Gracchus. To sort of inflate uh, the weight of Gaius to inflate his his um, his reward. Now the resistance of the patrician class, the elite class, to institute re uh, institute reforms, doomed the republic. It doomed them to suffer from a series of tumults, internal tumults. The motivation of the Gracchi uh, continues to puzzle us. What 
what uh what their intention was with the ultimate gold was we really don't know we don't know if they were simply two uh idealistic young guys who were looking to reform their society we don't know if they were truly uh altruistics um jeff wanted to uh who jeff wanted to help their country help their fellow citizen or whether they were self-motivated ambitious young men looking to exploit a clever new way to gain power uh, by supporting the common people. We don't know. Now, another question to consider is what would have happened if the Roman Senate had agreed with the Gracchi legislative plan? If if Tiberius was never murdered, if they simply agreed with everything that, that, that Tiberius had proposed, what would have happened? Would those reforms have extended, uh, have, have, have uh, had extended the life of the Roman Republic? We don't know. We will never know. Um, but what became certain was that the Republic was now heading towards disaster. Um, it, it was on course for, for disaster. The, the first of the, of the dist uh, gruntled groups in, in Roman Italy to reach critical mass and to, and to openly revolt against Roman hegemony were the Italic allies. Uh, the same groups that had fought in the imperial wars with Rome for hundreds of years now um, they, they, they stuck with Rome through, Han through the, uh, through the Hannibalic invasion of Italy, uh, through the Pyrrhic War, through the conquest of Hispania, through the conquest of North Africa, through the conquest of the Eastern Mediterranean, through, through the, uh, wars against the Hellenistic kingdoms. They stuck with the, with the Roman Republic, and they felt they had earned full citizenship, uh, due to their loyalty, due to their service. The Romans refused to consider this matter at all. Uh, so the fed up allies rebelled against Rome and they formed a confederation of their own, a confederation that excluded Rome. Now the resulting war is known as the social war. Uh, and, and that's because uh, the Latin for ally is socii. So it's literally just the ally war. Um, now the social war was a brutal and destructive affair. Both sides were using the same tactics, the same strategies, and they had the same armaments. It was essentially an Italic civil war, and it lasted for three years. Now, the Romans, in the end, were able to triumph by making concessions to some of their former allies to bring to uh, to cause them to end their war against the Romans and to come back into the Roman fold. Uh, but in the end, the Romans, even though they defeated their their allies and it brought them all back into the Roman Confederation, in the end, the Romans were forced to grant the concessions that their allies had wanted in the first place. They granted all of the Italic allies full Roman citizenship. The entire war is really just a tragic example of the Roman inability to simply adapt as is. This, this highlights the Roman resistance to change. Now, the next group to void their dissatisfaction with violence were the slaves. And the death of the Roman Republic uh, bore witness to a number of large slave revolts. And these are known as the Servile Wars. Um, servile, of course, for, 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 for the, uh, the slaves, the servants who rose up against their, their masters, their Roman masters. Now, there are memorable slave revolts uh, that, that, that occurred during this time. One of which was an event in which the, the slaves on the island of Sicily rose up um, and, and they seized the island. And they defied Roman attempts to conquer the island of Sicily for one year. Now the second great slave revolt during this period was led by a man named Spartacus. Uh, and he, and his, his revolt is the more famous of them. There have been a lot of books written and there was a major motion picture and uh, a television show, a television movie, uh, a, a lot of uh, a lot of um, attention has been played to to Spartacus. Spartacus was a Thracian gladiator, uh, a, a Thracian slave who was forced to fight in the uh, the gladiatorial game to combat the the, the, uh, the combat game to death for Roman enjoyment. Um, he he led a rebellion in southern Italy. And this rebellion was eventually put down by Marcus Licinius Crassus. But the Spartacus Rebellion is memorable for the punishment sentence uh, that, the, that the surviving slaves received. The surviving 6,000 slaves were all crucified along the Appian Way, that first uh, major uh, public roadway um, constructed by the Romans. Um, they were all crucified there as a remainder for the other slaves of the price of rebellion. Um, at this point, the main 
uh, Roman Republic. Uh, at this point, the Roman Republic is mainly just teetering on the edge of their political system. Um, uh, Roman politics, the Roman political system, it came from within. It is inherently broken. The story heats up uh, with the arrival of three men on the political scene. Um, Marcus, La, 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 Marcus Licinius Crassus, Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, and of course Gaius Julius Caesar. These men would form an unscrupulous political alliance known as the First Triumvirate. And they would dominate the affairs of the Republic uh, for years to come. We will break here. And when we come back, we will pick up our story, our examination of the Roman of Roman history with the careers of those men. We will look at the careers of the of the of the the, the biographies and the careers up until that point of the men who formed the first triumvirate. As always, I am Ted. Hit like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what you thought about this lecture. Um, and I'll see you guys next time.